We'll start in uh, one or two minutes. Okay, so um, my name is Ross Douglas, and I'm the CEO and founder of Autonomy. So a very warm welcome to the third edition of Autonomy, um, both to our sponsors, our partners, and the many delegates attending. Up front, I'd also like to thank Stephanie Hagen, who's put the Summit Conference program together this year, and to Amrik Valant and the team at Autonomy for bringing the third edition together. So I often get asked about my motivation for creating autonomy and what was the origins of the idea of creating a conference, an exhibition, and summit on the future of urban mobility. And I think it goes back to two experiences. The one was reading the book Heat, written by George Monbiot in 2006. And at the time I, wrote, I read the book, I'd spent the previous few years making wildlife films, writing about fragile ecosystems, and I was really struck about how much we have to lose from the consequences of global warming. The second experience was a couple of years later, when in the same year I was working in Lagos and Copenhagen. And in Lagos, I would rent a driver, as you do in Lagos. I'd sit in the back of a Toyota Corolla, and I would achieve at best four kilometers an hour of commuting. Um, my record in Lagos was I achieved three meetings in one day, which took six hours of commuting. And I'd finish the day and end the day completely ill and exhausted from incredibly high nitrous oxide and pollution levels. By comparison in Copenhagen, I rented a cheap bicycle and achieved seven meetings in one day, making myself two and a half times more efficient for the same amount of time spent. And this really made me understand that there was an opportunity to bring these two interests together and create a platform where the future can be made. So let's have a look where we are today in terms of global warming, demographics, and the way we move around cities. The latest report by the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came out a few weeks ago, and I spent some time going through it and reading it. In short, what it tells us is that we have to halve our carbon emissions in the next 12 years, which brings us to 2030, and then we have to be carbon neutral in the, in the following 20 years by 2050. Being carbon neutral means what us humans emit in carbon dioxide, the planet's oceans and forests can reabsorb. But by 2050, the world's population would have moved from today's 7.6 billion people to something closer to 10 billion. And as the world economy doubles every 25 to 30 years, there'll be twice as much money in the economy to build homes, consume meat, meat, fly internationally, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> let's now have a look at the way we move around in, in cities today. The predominant means of transport is still the motor car. There are one billion combustion motor cars on the planet, of which they get used an average of 4% of their time. The other 96%, they are parked and devaluing. In America, for example, there are 750 million parking bays occupying a space of about 62,000 square kilometers, which is about two-thirds the size of Portugal. So whenever you get such an economic inefficiency, it's likely for a disruption. So why do I tell you these two stories and what does it mean? What it means is that urban mobility is about to undergo a fun fundamental disruption, mainly for three reasons. The first is that the economic inefficiencies of car ownership is the opportunity for big companies to get in and change the model. It's no surprise that the most valued startups in the world are Uber and Didi Chuxing, both companies that provide urbanites with an alternative to car ownership and car driving. The second reason is that cities are looking for ways to move more people on a given amount of surface space. So what we see, for example, in Paris is car lanes being repurposed or reduced to, re to accommodate cycle lanes because bicycles can move more people on the same surface area. And we will start seeing very shortly parking bays being repurposed to accommodate more citizens, more urbanites, as cities continue to densify. 
And then the third reason is that policymakers and citizens will look towards personal transportation to rapidly re reduce their carbon emissions. So the levels of investment indicate that people understand that this disruption is going to become a massive industry. According to Lufthansa's Innovation Hub last year, 2017, attracted $25 billion of investment from VCs into startups in the mobility space. So while it's great that we have this kind of level of investment and enthusiasm for new mobility, how do we ensure that we do not replace one dysfunctional system with yet another dysfunctional system? And I believe that the only way to do that is for the mobility ecosystem to come together. And what I mean by the ecosystem is a combination of innovators, finances and funders, and policymakers. And the reason why they need to come together is that we need to discuss, negotiate, and collectively choose the right technology to build a sustainable transport future. In terms of the IPCC um, paper, this is our last chance to build a sustainable future. At Autonomy this year, we can see the start of these sustainable technologies from established players like Nissan, Toyota, Tesla, Jaguar with their electric vehicles to interesting startups like Volocopter and Lilium. On the funding side, later this morning, we have more than 50 VCs who will be listening to startup pitches at funding the movement in the middle of the venue. And finally, on the policymaker side, France and the European Union are very fortunate to still have enlightened politicians who believe that reducing carbon emissions is in the interest of all of us. I would like then to extend a warm welcome to the Minister of Transport, Elizabeth Bourne, and the Secretary of State and Minister of Economy and Finance, Muni Mujabi, who have chosen autonomy to hold the, the first strategic data committee and who will speak in this venue later this morning. Welcome also to our friend Karim Adeli, President of the Transport and Tourism Commission at the European Parliament, to Anne-Marie Idrak, High Representative of the French Government for the Development of Autonomous Vehicles, and to First Deputy Mayor Emmanuel Grégoire, who participated in our press conference last week. We are also very happy once again to welcome Deputy Mayors for Paris, Christophe Najowski, in charge of transport, and Jean-Louis Missica, in charge of urbanism and innovation. Finally, before handing over to the first panel, I would like to leave you with one final thought. The world's megacities are looking for new mobility solutions as they continue to densify. Which city can take the lead as, a com take the, lead as the world mobility capital and build a multimodal system that uses a combination of active mobility, which is walking and cycling, data analytics, electric solutions, which includes public, uh, electric solutions, shared mobility, which includes public transport, and finally, autonomous vehicles to move people. I believe that Paris is in the perfect position to create this ideal, as it is one of the true multimodal cities, thanks largely to its excellent public transport infrastructure. Not only does Paris have the ability, but it also has the opportunity during the Olympics in 2024 to showcase carbon-free mobility to the world. Thank you, and I'd now like to introduce our first